in the name of Jesus. Amen. It's one thing to lose your attention for a moment, but if you're not careful, uh, a distraction can become a disaster. And the devil loves distractions. He loves to distract husbands from their wives and wives from their husbands and children from their parents. He loves to distract Christians from Christ, servants from their calling, churches from their mission. And this is what Jesus is talking about when he says, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. As we alluded to just a few minutes ago, when you, when you plow a field, whether you, are, whether you are leading a team of oxen or whether you're sitting atop a tractor, if you turn back, if you get distracted, that can turn quickly into a disaster. Friends, the call of Christ, our baptismal call, is, is a call to trust. It is a call to, to focus, to, to remain true to Christ and focused on him and his word regardless of your circumstances and regardless of your position in life, whether you are a prophet or an apostle or a parishioner. And the prophet Elijah is a great example of just how difficult this actually is. When we, come to, when we came to our Old Testament reading today in 1 Kings 19, uh, Elijah had been fleeing for his life. Why? Because he was doing his job. He proclaimed to wicked King Ahab and his even wicked-er wife, Jezebel, the word of the Lord. He called them, for, called them out for their idolatry, the king for leading the people away from the worship of the Lord and toward the worship of this false god, Baal, that required of them child sacrifice and aberrant sexual practice and all sorts of different things. And for this, and then there was, of course, a confrontation in the immediately preceding section of the scripture with these prophets of the false god, Baal. Right? And Elijah confronted them, and the Lord gave a great victory and even death to these false prophets of Baal. And how did wicked Queen Jezebel respond? She sends a messenger to Elijah and says, So may my gods do to me, and more also, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. And so Elijah was afraid, and he arose and ran for his life. And that's where we find him in our Old Testament reading today in 1 Kings 19 in a cave, having fled for his life. And there in that cave, the Lord teaches Elijah an important lesson. Not necessarily to, to see the Lord in the great and tremendous things such as an earthquake or a fire, but in the still small voice of the word of God. What are you doing here, Elijah, the Lord said. And Elijah said, I've been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant and thrown down your altars and killed your prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left. And they seek my life to take it away. I wonder how many of you have ever felt like that, especially those of you who have a few years in Christ under your belt, maybe years, maybe decades of following Christ, maybe somewhere along the line, or maybe even right now, you're saying, I've come to church, I've tithed, I've volunteered, and why, God, why is this happening to me? Now, of course, you don't have to be a Christian to say why, God, is whatever it is is happening to you. And sometimes we know who have lived a while, we know that sometimes life isn't fair. And sometimes in the midst of whatever it is you're in the midst of, God does not seem like a just God. Now, in the end, in Elijah's case, we know Elijah was vindicated. God rescued him and eventually took him up into heaven. I wonder in the time between his time in the cave and when he was taken up into heaven, I wonder if Elijah didn't have cause to think about what he had said, about how he had doubted a bit and said, why me? I wonder if that wasn't in that time a cause for repentance for Elijah. And I'll bet that's true for a lot of us here today as well. How many of us have cried out to God at somewhere along the way and said, why me, why me, why is this happening, Lord? And even shaken our fist at God. 
And now you can look back and in hindsight, you can see how the Lord has worked all things together for good. And so maybe for you, this morning is a time where maybe you haven't thought about it in that way before. Or maybe in a different way. It's time for you this morning to say, forgive me to the Lord who you doubted, to the Lord who, re who maintained an absolute focus for you and for your salvation. And, and that, friends, that is what our text in Luke 9 in the Gospel is about. This is a, it is a turning point in Luke's Gospel. It is a turning point in the ministry of Jesus. Verse 51 says, When the days drew near for Jesus to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. When the days drew near for him to be taken up, that is an allusion to the cross, where he would be literally taken up on the cross for us, for all of our distractions, and for all the collateral damage that those distractions cause. Let's talk just about a couple examples for a moment. Think about fathers. Fathers, when, when, when we get distracted, when we turn back, when we turn aside as fathers and focus on ourselves or something else than our calling to our children, to our, to our wives, when we turn aside like that, we don't end up just doing damage to ourselves. There's all kinds of collateral damage to children, to wife, to aunts and uncles and grandparents and, and neighbors, right? When we, when we turn aside and lose, lose focus on what God has called us to do, there is all kinds of damage that is often done. Children, your calling in Christ is, fourth commandment, to honor your father and your mother. This, this we understand this way, that God, how, how do, what does this mean, Luther's small catechism? We should fear and love God so that we do not despise or anger our parents and other authorities, but honor them, serve and obey them, and love and cherish them. And so as children, when, when we turn aside, when we get distracted and just focus on ourselves or some other thing, when we don't want to listen to our parents, when we think they're stupid and they don't have anything to say, that's generally about 12 through 21 or 2 or 3 or 4, something like that. But we know when we do that, right, and that, but it can be any time, right? When we, do, when we do that, when we do that, when we say, you know, basically say, Mom and Dad, I don't want to listen to you, I don't want to, you know, we end up, causing damage, we end up causing trouble for ourselves, but not just for ourselves, because mom and dad have to deal with this, and brothers and sisters have to deal with this, and aunts and uncles and grandparents have to deal with this. So you see, when, when we get distracted, it, it can become a disaster, and it's, it's for, all the, for all that collateral damage that is caused, and so much more that Jesus is taken up on the cross. Jesus came to take our place, to stand in our place, to be our vicar, to be righteous for us, to walk the way perfectly before God for us. And that is, that is why he sets his face toward Jerusalem. He is resolute. He is focused. He is determined. Jesus is absolutely focused on Jerusalem and what must happen there. Jesus came to fulfill God's plan. And he says, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Now, if that's the case, the truth is that there's only one of us who is pure. There's only one of us who has maintained absolute focus on God and his will. There's only one of us who loved God with all his heart and mind and soul and strength. Only one of us who truly and fully loved his neighbor as himself. And that, that one is our brother and our Savior, Jesus Christ. So friends, for all of us, regardless of your age or your position in life, whether you are a, a prophet, an apostle, a pastor, a parishioner, whatever, it is, it is caused today for all of us to repent, 
to stop making our bargains with God and our caveats and saying, God, if you do this, I'll do this. It's time to stop and, and confess to, before God our distractions and how those distractions have, for each of us in our own way, often become disasters. It's time to confess all that and to place our faith not, not in ourselves, but wholly and completely, fully in Jesus Christ. This is why St. Paul says in Philippians 3, Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ as my Lord. For his sake I have to suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish. All that other stuff that I had, it is absolute trash. It is garbage. In order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, that is, that, that is, I don't have salvation, faith, righteousness from what I do, but rather that which comes from God, that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share in his sufferings. Yes, following Christ is challenging. Becoming like him in his death, that by all means... I may attain to the resurrection of the dead. Our baptismal call in Christ is a call to trust. It is a call to focus. It is a call to focus on Christ regardless of our circumstances. It is a call especially to recognize how we don't focus and how thanks be to God Christ has taken the road for us and stands in our place and claims you as his own. So let's pray. Lord Jesus, you call us your brothers and sisters. You have forgiven us and called us to freedom. Help us not to use that freedom as an opportunity for the flesh to be distracted by things that are not of your will but rather through love to serve one another as you, Lord, have served us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. We gather our tithes and offerings.